you. And staying on the topic of scaffolding, um, where do you think students are more likely to need scaffolding whenever, especially you're thinking about Russian and the online environment? And Heather, since we were talking about layouts, where do you think they really need that scaffolding? I mean, definitely when they're encountering any sort of text um, and, and, you know, and, and of course audio too, but um, uh, everywhere for my first year, for my first year students, everywhere, every time they encounter Russian um, text and audio. Definitely. And yes, seeing that um, Russian does not use the Roman alphabet, it's just so important to have that scaffolding because otherwise, you, I, as a teacher of Japanese, I dread those blank stares when you pull up a website, for example, and students just aren't making any connections. So definitely important to put that in a lot of places. Uh, mm -hmm. Shannon, same question. Whenever you are uh, working with students, where do you think students are gonna be more likely to need that scaffolding in the online classroom? I mean, I agree with Heather that it's everywhere and it's um, there aren't a lot of shortcuts, but um, uh, maybe I can, I can um, answer this by describing um, one set of lessons that I've developed. I'm, um, I teach, as I mentioned before, I teach first year and second year, but second year is kind of my domain. I'm always the one teaching second year and I sort of sometimes teach first year. But so as I uh, told you before, uh, we use the textbook Mies Dunami for the first three semesters. And then that leaves me the fourth semester um, of my second year class. And what I've done with this semester is I've uh, developed a set of my own materials. Uh, and the idea behind this whole semester for me is that it's kind of a transition from the textbook to authentic materials. And of course, we still do use authentic materials in, in first year, but um, the bulk of their work is using a textbook. Um, and so kind of then going to mostly using authentic materials and longer things um, is the goal. And so I developed a set of uh, lessons that we do in the very beginning of that semester and then what they lead up to is that then after we finish that uh, kind of unit, um, we then go on to the rest of the semester being all based on authentic materials. It can be either uh, cartoons, we've used Chaburashka or uh, Vinnie uh, or um, in recent years, I've been going more towards using sitcoms. And um, we mentioned on Monday that um, kind of the worse, the better as far as language goes in a way, because um, sitcoms are great in a variety of ways, because number one, they're uh, predictable. Um, they use physical humor. Um, and also they, they use stereotypes, which of course stereotypes are a bad thing in a lot of ways, but um, you know, uh, students need to know what are what are the stereotypes in Russian culture that you need to know about. And so we talk about those stereotypes when we use the sitcoms. And I can mention that the two sitcoms that I've used so far, my favorite one is Kakya Stal Ruskim, How I Became Russian. They love that one. Um, and it's, it's wonderful in all these ways because you learn uh, the main character is an American who comes to work in Russia. And so, of course, he makes all those faux pas that uh, students learn not to make, like giving um, a, an even number of flowers to someone, for example. Um, and so uh, they are encountering this character who is American, and then he's learning about Russian culture. Um, and so, of course, this is kind of full of, of these stereotypes, which are something they need to know. And so we talk about those things. Um, the other sitcom that I've used is uh, Sluga Naroda, um, which is also uh, an interesting one, The Servant of the People, the same one that uh, President Zelensky uh, played in when he was an actor and comic. Um, and so this is especially appealing for students who are political science, uh, you know, people who are interested in politics. Um, but anyway, uh, to lead up to the sitcoms, I have a set of lessons where I'm focusing on transitioning them from 
sort of textbook to authentic materials. And so the lessons, um, one of them is kind of an introductory lesson. And then we have one that's on cognates, recognizing cognates, because I have noticed over the years that students are, are much worse at this than I thought they would be. Um, they don't recognize cognates very well, at least according to what I expected. And so I uh, kind of explicitly go through some of the things that um, make a word, uh, if you're, that if you know about it, that make a word obviously a cognate. So for example, if it has an F in it, it's probably a cognate. And so there are some other things in there that sort of just attune them to looking for cognates and recognizing those. Uh, the next lesson is about word formation, which I think is so, so helpful for students because I remember as a student not realizing that, for example, you know, knizhka is the same thing as kniga. I didn't, I didn't understand that. And so I would be looking up things like knizhka uh, when I was learning Russian. And so just getting students to the point where they recognize the relationships between words that have similar roots and, you know, why part of recognizing the part of speech of a word can be so useful, especially with reading um, and, you know, kind of getting them to the point where they recognize what they already know, you know, you know, the word Vsoki, but uh, you don't, maybe you don't need to then to look up Vsata, right? You can say, maybe those two words are related. And so we kind of explicitly go through some of that word formation. I also have a lesson on it's called using a dictionary, but at this point I should probably change it to using, I don't know, it's not only dictionaries, it's also translators. And at some point I probably need to add, I haven't done it yet, but I probably need to add a section about um, how to uh, productively use AI tools. Um, and so I have, uh, uh, up till then, I kind of discouraged them from using dictionaries and I asked them to focus more on the words that they get in the textbook. But at this point, when they're kind of going to be starting to uh, encounter more and longer authentic texts, they probably need to have practice with these tools. And as we know, it's not easy. To, it seems like it should be easy to use a dictionary, but it's not. They pick just the first thing that's that's written uh, if they get a definition when there are, you know, a hundred different possibilities. And so I try to, it doesn't, of course, they're not experts at it right away, but try to at least get them start thinking about what are some of the different strategies for using these tools like dictionaries and translators. And then I have specific lessons that are strategies for reading and strategies for listening. And so I kind of explicitly um, try to help them with strategies for dealing with authentic materials at that particular point in this is the fourth semester. Uh, sorry, she asks, have you been able to find it with subtitles? No, I don't. I use it without subtitles. So I have them watch it. They watch it several times and they do a bunch of activities that help them understand it. So I require that they watch it beforehand and then we do a bunch of activities on it, uh, sort of at, both out of class and in class. And then I require that they watch it again so that hopefully the last time that they watch it, they understand a lot more than they did the first time. So I'm actually glad it's not out there with subtitles because I want them to challenge themselves without it. Uh, certainly, um, you know, subtitles are a great tool for certain for certain things, but for this particular assignment, I want them to use it without subtitles. Shannon, I, I do the same thing with Kakya Um, And I usually actually um, direct my students to a particular part of the episode. I sometimes, um, just take clips and have them focus on certain aspects of language. Like I think there's a Novacelia in one and we look at um, specific language around uh, that event, but we watch it several times. And I also appreciate just like Shannon, I kind of appreciate that there aren't subtitled versions of it yet. Definitely helpful if they're not able to just look to the English and, and they have to actually figure out what's being said. So definitely helpful to not have the subtitles just like in this case. Really good. I'm going a little bit off script here, but we had a really good question come in from Olga. I'm talking a little bit about scaffolding, segueing into maybe how 
if you could speak a little bit about how maybe you have in the past helped to support students with learning exceptionalities or maybe need some accommodations to kind of level the playing field for all of our students. Uh, certainly for those of us who are K-12 educators, especially if we have a student who has an IEP 504 and needs that accommodation to be successful in our classes, it's something we have to be really mindful of in the K-12 field. And I was just wondering if either of you had any thoughts on things you might do to help students with exceptionalities. Um, yeah, uh, we actually had a student last year um, who was visually impaired and we had to very quickly um, kind of scramble to put alt text on all of our images and to um, transcribe or um, not transcribe, um, but basically to put uh, alt text on all of our images and to um, transform our PDFs um, into documents that were readable um, with uh, with our program. Um, and I I support really anything that is going to work for the student. Um, so the suggestion to do. Um, you know, uh, speech to text, I think is is wonderful, um, a wonderful option. Um, and one thing I've been trying to do, um, especially in regards like our, our new project and transforming our online materials into an OER, um, I'm having to go back and review the thousands and thousands of images we have embedded into um, our Canvas courses and make sure one, that they're usable, that we can actually share them, but um, make sure that they are accessible and that they have really um, detailed alt text for um, anyone with low vision or uh, visual impairment. It can definitely be time consuming, but definitely a worthwhile project for sure. Uh, Shannon, any thoughts on things you've maybe done in the past or things that you do to make learning easier for students with exceptionalities. I feel like it's maybe not that different from what I was saying before about online tools, having the ability to um, offer so much support uh, without it being obtrusive. So I feel like that kind of inherently um, allows people with very different um, abilities to access materials. Just, I don't have a, a lot to add, but um, one thing that I've done in the past with um, online students, which I think can be useful for everyone, but maybe in particular for people who have challenges, is uh, to build in as part of their assignment that they uh, have to um, kind of talk, uh, tell me at the end of the assignment what questions they have. Not saying, not, not uh, phrasing it as, do you have questions, but saying, what is your question? Um, and, and kind of having that as a required part. I, I think a lot of us have the experience that when we teach face-to-face, -face, we get very used to that confused face that students give us. Um, you know, we get to know the students well enough that we can tell when a particular person uh, isn't quite uh, with us in a particular activity and being able to intercept that. And I think that's something that's a lot more difficult online uh, because it's just a lot harder to see those faces. And sometimes we're not allowed to require them to put on their cameras, although I think I would advocate for cameras on if possible. But, um, you know, in some instances, we're supposed to not uh, require them to put on their cameras. And so that makes it a lot harder to identify those moments when anybody, but, uh, you know, in particular students who have uh, maybe disabilities, for example, uh, need extra help. And so I think building in as part of your assignment that you have to say, what was the most difficult part of this assignment for you? Or what question do you still have about this? Or what, uh, there can be different ways of wording it, but I think that can be something um, worth considering. Absolutely. And just leaving that space open so students know that they can ask that question. And sometimes even the online experience, it's a little nicer to be able to privately send a question rather than being the sole person raising your hand in a face-to-face -face class to say, I don't understand. It can be a little intimidating, especially whenever that effective filters up and you want to kind of get in there and, and break that down. So really good idea. Something that I think would be really good to implement. Excellent. Um, jumping into a little bit about authentic materials 